So thank you all for coming. Um, my name is Kelly Lunston. I'm the business segment manager for advanced cytometry here at Biolegend. Uh, what we're going to talk about today is um, polychromatic flow cytometry in the context of in vivo applications. So um, what we're going to talk about specifically are the different kinds of in vivo applications of antibodies, either stimulating different populations or um, blocking function or upregulating or somehow modulating the activity that's occurring. Um, we're going to talk about how you would construct that assay from conception to completion. So basically that would be once you know what markers that you're interested in having comprise the panel, that would be biologically specific for, for your interest area, um, how you would organize that panel. So that would be things like matching reagents for the brightness of the fluorophore to the abundance of the antigen. But it also has a lot to do with things that are more downstream. Um, things like how you're going to analyze that particular um, application when you, you know, running the assay actually is one of the easier elements of the process. It's analyzing the data on the other hand, um, on, the, on the back end of that process that becomes actually quite difficult when you start to go above 10 colors. So we're going to talk about kind of the process within there to make sure that when you do get to that point, you have the cleanest set of data possible to make your analysis um, very internally consistent, reproducible, and, um, and clear and easy. We're going to discuss all the appropriate controls that are involved in that process. So um, not only using single color biological controls in order that you can appropriately assess the voltage range of each PMT to make sure that no matter what small changes happen with expression, that you can keep the same voltages for the course of the majority of your experiment. That will really help you out when you have to start applying things like FMO controls. Um, FMO controls, the definition is fluorescence minus one controls. When you start going above kind of six to eight to 10 colors, you start to have a lot of additive background that's happening within your MFI negative population. And so when we're assessing where we want to place the gate for our MFI positive population, for our truly positive population, we have to take into account the additive background that would not be represented in a single color control. So fluorescence minus one is literally the presence of every single fluorophore in the assay, except for the one that you're interested in gating on, and that will show you where the kind of lower limit is to distinguish between signal and noise. Um, we will talk a little bit about isotype controls, but mostly in the context of fluorescence minus one controls. So we will talk a lot about the additive effects of background on resolution when you start to get, you know, this particular assay is going to show you an example of 15 color aminophenotyping. Um, when you get to that level and you're, and you're forced to use fluorophores like PECF594 or PECI5, things that are very, um, are nestled into a space where a, a lot of floors with overlapping spectra are populating, um, that, can, that can have a big impact on the spread of the MFI negative. So we're gonna discuss something called photon counting error, um, which is, um, a, a digital distribution of error because of our, our inability to appropriately account the, the validity of a single photon. But we'll, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, it is actually an artifact of applying compensation. So if in the context of these multicolor applications, how do we minimize the effect that compensation has on our ability to, again, get internally consistent, resolvable data? So the reason that I got interested in in vivo applications of these antibodies is largely because we all know that immuno, um, kind of immunomodulation or immunotherapies are the wave of the future. So having things like cetuximab or targeted monoclonal antibody therapies is humongous right now. It's just a matter of finding the right molecular targets. And specifically, one of my colleagues during a development meeting was talking about an antibody called DR3 where when it was injected into a mouse, within about, um, within about four days, they saw a really significant increase in the resident population of Tregs in um, the mouse spleen. That's pretty significant, especially if it could potentially be used therapeutically to suppress transplant rejection or something like that. Um, and in general, I'm going to use this term a lot, it's called LEAF. It's a low endotoxin azide-free format of an antibody that just ensures that what when you are doing a direct injection of an antibody, that you're not encountering some aberrations that come with contamination of that antibody. And so there are different 
levels of contamination <laughs> that could occur. So there's a leaf format that's going to be a 0.1 unit per microgram. And then there's going to be an ultra leaf format, which would really be what you would desire for in vivo injection, versus the leaf format would probably be suitable just for um, in situ stimulation. So, you know, this kind of definitely led me to think about what other sort of markers, what sort of antibodies do we have that people are regularly requesting as custom formats to be purified to a leaf quality. Um, and there are just so many. Um, you know, some of these are actually in therapeutic contention. So things like CTLA-4, that's actually one that could potentially become a therapy, um, where its stimulation leads to a downstream effect. CD-137, where a co-stimulation leads to a down... Um, ICAS, where it's a blocking effect. BTLA, which is a stimulation effect. And um, CD-127, which is a blocking effect. All of them are going to modulate a pathway in some way that could be desirable for you in, in, um, in an animal model. But, you know, the resources that I have here at BioLegend to conduct experiments are somewhat limited. We have a lot of mouse for, um, a lot of mice for ascites production or hybridoma development, that sort of thing. But we don't have the ability to have a lot of um, genetic models here. Um, so I had to basically create my condition and then try to modulate my condition. And, you know, it's, it's hilarious. You can find back into the 1990s where there were people trying to stimulate T cell specific um, responses using CD3. It's a particular clone of CD3 um, that they found to be most efficacious. And a lot of it was talking about um, basically a cytokine storm that occurs right after the injection and it's a T cell specific response. So that was a very easy way to have a selective stimulation. And there's so many different disease states where if we could modulate or, or suppress T cell stimulation, it would be extremely beneficial for the, for the person. Um, one that I came across that I really attached to um, was a VISTA format that we were working on at the time. And it's a PD homolog one um, and it has um, already been shown in situ to suppress T cell activation. So in this instance, the protocol that I came up with, and I'm going to keep referring to very particular conditions, so let me explain this well to you. Um, the mice that I'm working with are going to be all six to eight week old BALB-C um, female mice. There are three different treatment conditions. The first is going to be just CD3, so just that stimulation, just that effect. Um, the second is basically a co-injection of the CD3 and the VISTA. Um, the VISTA, we weren't exactly sure. We did a, a lot of preliminary work to determine how much CD3 to inject, and that was actually relatively well described in the literature as well. I could have probably even gone down to 25 microgram. We didn't have to necessarily do 50. Um, but, you know, the VISTA application, on the other hand, was extremely not well described in the literature. It was a lot of guesswork. Um, so we went with kind of a potentially a pretty high concentration of the VISTA just to ensure that we were getting sufficient coverage. Um, so we used 100 micrograms of the VISTA. And then, of course, for every single um, um, experimental condition, we had an isotype control to, um, to meter it, to, to compare against. So that would be either 50 micrograms or 150 micrograms worth of a hamster isotype because both of them were derived in hamster. And of course, the isotype control as well was a leaf format, so there was no, no differences. So for each of these three conditions, we had three different time points. We knew that the cytokine storm occurs extremely fast, actually within the first 30 minutes. Um, but this was already a significant number of animals to process. So we went with three different time courses, sorry, three different time points, two hours, six hours, and 24 hours. Um, from the, each of those time points, we then harvested the spleen, the draining lymph nodes, and um, the blood we actually had to get from a tail vein cut um, as we wanted to do four different cytokine measurements and we needed a sufficient amount of blood. So in all, it was 26 samples over the course of three days and all of this, um, the panel that I'm going to show you, they're all done unfixed on live cells um, and I'll show you the, the series of markers that we were interested in. All right, so here's a full list of of largely markers that we got out of the literature that were implicated in this process. So some of them were known. And you know, when you have a list of markers, the first thing that you have to do in your mind is organize how well you, um, you understand their expression and what sort of expression you're going to expect from them. So for, um, for your basic phenotypic markers, that's what we would call your primary tier. And they're going to be anything that tends to be discreetly resolved 
um, of a relatively consistent known um, percent within a given population, within a spleen, for example. And um, it doesn't mean that they're always extremely abundant, but they are molecules that I can get to resolve, markers that I can get to resolve into a resolvable population versus expression markers or activation markers where your range of expression is very variable. And those we call dynamic range expressors. So that's what you would consider to be your secondary tier, are these molecules where you're not going to get that population to just pop off of your negative. Um, it's going to be something you're going to have to work at being able to resolve well. And then finally, your tertiary tier are going to be any molecules where you don't have a complete understanding of what expression to expect. They're going to be your anomaly or your unknown. Um, you might be able to do some preliminary work to test out each condition and make sure that you're within a good working range or you know, titrating these antibodies appropriately, but at any point, you know, you can't literally conduct the whole experiment <laughs> one time through and, and, and then start committing to it. You know, a lot of it's going to be unknown before you start. So for us, those were ICOS, um, where I, I didn't know a lot about ICOS. It actually ended up being a molecule that came into extremely strong expression, but at a later stage. So my initial six-hour stimulations were not giving me a full picture of my ICOS expression versus the 24-hour, for example. Um, my fast ligand um, had been implicated in the literature as being important because with stimulation comes proliferation and apoptosis. Um, so we were just basically using fast ligand to keep a finger on um, whether or not our results were being confounded by apoptosis. And then PD-1 and PD-L1, obviously, because we're using a PD-1H homologue. Okay, from once I have them all organized in my mind, I can actually start thinking about the fluorophores that I need to match to them. At 15, I'm very close to maxing out all of my potential options. So how I'm going to analyze them becomes extremely important. So I need to first consider the personality of each of the fluorophores. They're all very different in context. They're all very special and they all have their own weaknesses. So initially, um, we would start out with something like the synthetic organic fluorophores. So these are any fluorophore that we can synthetically make in C2. So they're raised in organic solvents. They're not affected by methanol or ethanol treatment. That's why we use them in applications like Phosflow, because they're very insensitive to um, denaturing solvents. Um, but the biggest limitation of this organic fluorophore family, like the Alexa floors or the Horizon floors or um, dialytes or anything like that, is simply that they're extremely small. And the, if you think about the structure of what an organic floor looks like, you have um, something like a pyrene or any sort of cyclical hydrocarbon. It's a rigid structure and the element of conductance of this molecule are going to be the shared electron pairs between each double bond of that structure. So the minute that one of those bonds is broken, you can no longer conduct energy around the circuit. It's called decentra decentralized electronic conductance. Um, when, you, when, you're bro when you've broken that circuit, it becomes non-fluorescent and basically returns to a state of being a chromogen, which is just a molecule that can absorb energy, like the color of my shirt, um, but cannot resonate it and emit it back to you. So these fluorophores and that um, kind of very defined small structure, it tunes the wavelength of excitation and emission, but it also limits the amount of energy that can, um, that can actually excite that molecule. And basic physics always tells us that you cannot emit more energy than you absorb. So if you're exciting with a, a higher energy, shorter wavelength, um, these molecules absorb that energy, jump to their excited state, but then they start to vibrate and lose some of that energy to their environment because it's not a closed system. And in doing that, they transition to a longer, lower energy wavelength that is the emission that we're detecting. And that stoke shift is extremely important. That's how we do any fluorescent assay is the difference between the excitation and the emission. So because they can't absorb that much energy, they can't emit that much energy, they're inherently going to be not particularly bright as a single molecule. So we rely on being able to conjugate many of them to a single, um, to a single um, antibody. Versus proteins like GFP, PE, APC, PER-CP, they're all um, derived from nature. And all of these fluorophores are actually embedded in that protein structure. So I like to use this example of, um, the, um, of the, uh, basically one subunit of phycoerythrin 
because um, as this arrow is pointing to, there are gonna be these molecules called bilins that are embedded within the protein um, of the actual phycoerythrin itself. Those bilins are the actual absorbing fluorophore of that macromolecule. Um, but unfortunately, there's no way for us to isolate those bilins from the protein to remove them from that 240 kilodalton massive molecule. I mean, it's twice the size of your antibody. Um, there's no way for us to remove those and for the bilins to remain fluorescent. So that protein is essential for encasing and embedding um, this molecule because as you can see from the structure um, of the bilin, you're going to see a lot of these points where the molecule can rotate and no fluorophore can rotate and remain quantum efficient. It, can, it, can't, it can't continue to hold its energy and be able to rotate around in space. So it requires that very rigid embedment into that PE in order for it to remain fluorescent. But what you should be able to see from the structure is we have a ton of bilins in there. You can have anywhere between 15 to 20 bilins embedded in a particular PE derivative. Um, and then that's a one-to-one -one conjugation with your antibody, so you're benefiting from the fluorescence of a lot of fluorophores. Um, however, because it is a protein, and that protein is essential to the fluorophore, if it's denatured in any way, whether it be by freezing and thawing, which any protein, including your skin, is extremely sensitive to being frozen and thawed, and your PE is no different, or to any organic solvents like methanol, um, which can collapse that, that rigidity. Um, but from those, from PE, because it has 15 chromophores that are donating energy to an acceptor, it makes a fantastic donor in a tandem, and that's why we use it so heavily for the fret relationship of all of our PE Psi 5, per CP Psi 5.5, all of those tandems that allow us to fill out a good nine colors on your flow cytometer. All right, so, so um, you know, there are strengths and weaknesses to both of these technologies, and that's the reality that we live in. Um, the organic, um, the brilliant violet fluorophores were developed um, almost as a hybrid of the two technologies. So because it's a polymer, you're going to have many absorbing units within the length of this polymer, and each is independently acting, similar to a PE, where each billin is independently acting. Um, however, it's entirely raised in organic solvents, and by that I mean acetone. And because of that, it's not going to be affected by its environment nearly as much as um, a protein would be. So I like to say that it's as if these two, organic and proteins, got together and they had a baby and they made kind of a molecule that is relatively um, fantastic for having the strengths of both of its parents. So the, the graph that you're looking at here is um, the st a staining index that I developed using all of the CD8 conjugates for every single fluorophore that we offer. And we do not offer PE Texas Red or PE CF594. Um, although that is actually quite a bright floor for CF594. So um, what's really important when you're looking at something like a staining index is to understand that it's being derived from um, very different instruments. For example, the instrument that I used is a Fortessa that has four lasers, a 561 being the, the fourth laser, um, and it has a particular set of highly optimized filters for the Brilliant Violet series. So what I found is that because fi the 561 laser um, most optimally cites PE and its tandems, I found that the two brightest ones were PE and PE5. However, if we had been using a 488 laser to do that excitation, that would drop the emission by about 40%. And that would all of a sudden make BV421 the brightest fluorophore. So that's why you can find that these could be quite variable between manufacturers, because it is very much dependent on as to how they derive the data. And this is only a tool. This is absolutely never a list of favorites. Because if this was a list of favorites, I can guarantee you PE Psi 5 is not my second most favorite fluorophore. Brightness is not always better, especially when it's really promiscuous into the filters and the PMTs of its neighbors. That brightness then actually really hurts you. So it's just a tool to give you a reference point for utility. For example, Fitzy which is a fluorophore that we've relied heavily on for years, it used to be one of the only three fluorophores that we could start with you know, 15 years ago. It's actually extremely dim, but when we have a machine like ours, where there's only two fluorophores that will be excited off the 488 laser, um, Fitzy is in an extremely sensitive channel that's not populating a lot of background from its neighbors, and so it then becomes bright. Because when we're talking about brightness, it's not just the absorption coefficient or the extinction coefficient, 
how much energy it absorbs by its efficiency, which is what I was telling you previously on the last side. That's the brightness of a single fluorophore. But then you also have then how many of those fluorophores you conjugate to an antibody, because that's the brightness in your biology, in your application. But then you also have sensitivity, and that's by far the most important practical consideration for us is that sensitivity is not just the brightness of that antibody, but it's also the amount of background that's being populated into that PMT. And when you're in a space like PE Texas Red, there's a lot of things that are spilling into that channel, or even more, BV421 or PE or APC, where we have a lot of tandems derived from each of those fluorophores, we will always have some spill back into that channel because of an incomplete transfer of energy between the donor and the acceptor. And because of that, we'll always have reduced sensitivity in each of those donor channels. Okay, so then there's always um, a consideration here as well. This was done, we call it staining index. It's not just um, signal to noise, because it's also just as important that we consider that the MFI negative will have a certain spread. It'll have a certain deviation or um, standard deviation from the, the center of that population. And especially as you get into the near infrared, um, as an artifact of the fluorophores emission, you will start to have a wider spread of the MFI negative than you do with, say, shorter fluorophores. So it's really important that you take not only the signal, which is your MFI positive, but your noise, the MFI negative, subtract those, and then divide them by two times the standard deviation of the negative. And that's really your true indication of signal to noise. All right, so the next two slides are probably my most requested slides on the planet. <laughs> if you want them, you can contact technical, technical assistance and we'll send them to you. Um, this is actually my list of favorites. It's the logic that I use when I'm constructing panels for people. Um, my expertise is the, or is the, the floor for chemistry and with that information, this is how I would assess panels of different number. So for example, if you wanna start out having a 17 color panel, which I've actually never been able to do myself, because it's extremely difficult to find a PE Psi 5.5 conjugate commercially. And that's the biggest limitation there. Um, however, if I did want to have 17, it would include that. 16 is actually not tremendously difficult. That's just every single one of these um, markers in black minus the PE Psi 5.5 in red. And I can show you examples of having, having done that. Um, I do want to point out that inserting things like a live dead probe or the live dead fixable probes that we have called the zombie dyes is a really great way of cleaning up problematic channels. So for example, if I am using all seven potential fluorophores off of my violet laser, a really great way to help clean up all the overlap is to use a live dead fixable in that channel because I'm dumping that signal. So as long as I titrate that live dead fixable probe down very far so that my live cells have very little background fluorescence, then I'm dumping all those dead cells well before I get into the rest of my analysis. And it's a great way just to clean up the overlap in that space. So those are the kind of strategies that we look, like, that we look at when we're trying to consider how to match the floors. So once we get to 16, 15 would be every single marker in this particular middle list. Um, if I want to go down to 14 and 13, I'm going to drop BV570 and um, PE Psi5. And that's not because BV570 is a bad fluorophore. It's simply that it's in a space with seven other fluorophores. And so again, I'm just starting to prune the different fluorophores in each, off of each laser so that I'm limiting how many I'm detecting at one time. And honestly, PE Psi5 would be dropped number one <laughs> because I'm going to show you a lot of information about how that can very quickly screw up an assay. Um, I like to use PE Psi 5 on any marker that I know I'm going to dump, like NK1.1 or um, something else that mostly I'm using a marker for in order to negate it from my analysis. That's a very quick way of removing the contribution of that fluorophore to my analysis. For a 12 color assay, and now we're getting to also those instruments like a Fortessa or an LSR2 where you only have a trigon off of your violet, um, these are um, this is the kind of list of fluorophores that you could potentially use, but it's going to start to become much more dependent on, on what your configuration actually is. And then, of course, you're going to have only fixed configuration instruments like Galeosos and Cantos. And for those, what we recommend is the Brilliant Violet 510 in lieu of V500. It's a fantastic fluorophore. It's very bright. 
Um, you can titrate down these antibodies very, very far. Um, or again, either of the zombie dyes, um, which are the live dead fixable probes for that space. Okay. So once we've kind of assessed all the strengths and weaknesses of all those fluorophores and we've thought about um, the number of markers that I want to use versus the, the fluorophores that I have to choose for, for those combinations, I'm going to look at that list and say, what concerns do I see in there? And the number one concern that I see is that it's 15 colors. So that tells me that no matter what, I'm going to have PE Sci-5 and per CP Sci-5.5. And our biggest issue there is that PE Sci-5 will be excited off of the green laser whereas um, per CP Sci-5.5 will not be excited off of the, um, I'm sorry, PE Sci-5 will be excited off the blue laser, whereas per CP Sci-5.5 will not be excited off the yellow-green laser. So PE Sci-5 will emit into per CP Sci-5.5, and per CP is not a particularly bright floor, and PE Sci-5 really is. So that's going to be a significant assault on the background of that channel. Um, you're also going to have significant cross-beam compensation of both of these fluorophores off of the red laser into APC and Alexa 700 that could cause you problems as well. So when that happens, my number one thought is that whatever cell type is expressing the marker that I'm using Alexa 700 on, I will try my best to try to not have a marker also on that cell um, that is co-expressed with per CP Sci 5.5. The easiest way for me to clean up my data is when I have two floors that have a lot of overlap, whether it be same laser or cross beam, to not put them on markers that are co-expressed on the same cell. Flow cytometry is a single cell technique. If it's not collecting the data when it passes by the laser, that one cell, then it's not populating the background to reduce the sensitivity of another channel. It's your number one tool to make 15 colors very doable and easy to analyze on the other side. So um, the other thing I need to look at, I have lots of these markers that really are not going to change tremendously with activation. Again, they're discreetly resolved. But I'm going to have a few of them that will change tremendously with activation. They'll go from being entirely negative to potentially being off scale. And that's going to make a really big difference for what this range of secondary uh, molecules are conjugated to and then how much background those fluorophores are populating. If they're not being expressed, if CD69 is not activated and it's on per CP Sci 5.5, then there's not going to be a lot of background into Alexa 700 because it's not there. However, the minute that CD69 becomes activated, I'm now detecting it with per CP Sci 5.5, I'm going to be putting a lot of background into Alexa 700. And so those dynamic range markers I have to consider for their variable degree of background contribution. And then I'm also going to have significant problem, problem child pairs, like these guys, PE Sci-5 and Percy P Sci-5.5, but also largely PE Sci-5 into APC, which is what I'm going to talk about later. Okay, so when we're talking about that additive background that's being populated, we're talking about the channel. It's not about the floor for being sensitive or being appropriately matched to the antigen target at this point. It's about how much background any particular channel is going to populate. So that could be because I'm using a tandem like BB421 or PE or APC. All of these are donating energy to another acceptor molecule. And in doing so, that is going to be an incomplete transfer of energy. So for here, um, the specter that we're looking at in yellow here is the um, is the emission of PE. The one in kind of purple pink here is PE Psi 7. So you can see how much emission coming from the PE Psi 7 is actually emitting back into PE. Well, PE has three tandems that <laughs> could seriously screw up the background or contribute quite a lot of background into that channel. That would be very much unwanted. So even though PE is very bright, my signal to noise is being affected. Um, I'm also going to have instances of crossbeam excitation, PE, Psi 5, and APC, or Alexa 647 probably being the best example of that. Psi 5 is Alexa 647. So the, the three Psi 5 acceptor molecules that I have conjugated to the PE, when it passes by the red laser, it's detecting those three Psi 5s. There's a temporal difference that helps us know that it's compensation we need to remove, but it doesn't stop that background from populating. Versus the antibody, 
if the antibody is a direct conjugate with Alexa 647, again, that's still only three fluorophores conjugated to that antibody. So if I'm populating the background of three Psi-5s that are co-expressed on the same cell as something I want to detect with a direct conjugate of Alexa 647, I'm screwed, right? The background will be much too high for me to still resolve Alexa 647 with, with any confidence. Um, there's obviously going to be exceptions in there if my PSI 5 is not highly expressed, the marker is like, C, like the CD69 example. If it's not expressed, it's not populating. The minute it is, it will become a problem. So we're also going to have a lot of same laser spillover. This is just one fluorophore spilling into its neighbor. The only time this causes us a, a tremendous amount of issue is if the guy who's spilling is much brighter than the guy he's spilling into. Right? So for example, that would be BV510 into BV570. That's not a pair I like people to use um, when the markers are co-expressed. Um, perfectly fine if they're not co-expressed. <laughs> Um, and then BV605 into BV650, again, a very bright one into a very dim one, um, and FITSI into PE um, when you're off of the blue laser. So you're going to have certain kind of pairs that I call problem children, but in particular, these would be the three that I would say would be precluding, so ones that you really should not use co-expressed. And that would be PE Psi 5 into Alexa 647, BV 510 into BV 570, and then PE Psi 5.5, which no one uses anyway. But in the event you think you want to, you should never use it with per CP Psi 5.5. Okay, so again, because of that spillover, all channels are not created equal. This was from a paper recently from the Rotorer Lab at um, the Vaccine Research Center at NIH which um, did a really extensive analysis of the sensitivity of each channel off of the um, Fortessa that they have. And so the, um, the detector is up top here, um, V being for violet, red obviously is R, green, and blue. Um, and then all the fluorophores, and the darker that, the, that the, um, the square is, the more contributing background it has to that channel, so the less sensitive that channel has become. So I plan on doing something like this off of our Fortessa with all the brilliant violets. It would not look like this because Q dots do not have, um, they're not tandems, so they wouldn't be spilling back a lot into the BB421 channel. Um, but this is something I encourage everyone to assess for their own instrument. All right, so when I have all that information, my final question is how will I analyze these? It's the most important question you have to answer yourself, but it's also the most complicated. If you think that you can do 16 colors with all co-expressed markers, it's going to be really, really, really hard <laughs> because you have no chance to avert disasters. Um, so I'm going to ask myself, what is the most, most likely path of analysis and um, who, what particular markers are going to be viewed in a bivariate together? And that's because of an artifact called spreading error. Um, spreading error is a photon miscounting error that the brighter the marker gets, the wider the distribution of the MFI positive gets, and the harder it is to have a clear delineation of the MFI positive and negative that's double positive. So I'm going to show you an example of that. It's a relatively complex um, kind of quandary in the field right now. All right, so for my particular assay, this is my path of analysis. From every single one of my markers, without knowing yet which fluorophores I'm going to dedicate, I know that I'm going to do my live dead versus CD3. I also know with my CD3 um, injection that I'm going to see a down regulation of CD3. So my gating here is actually just CD3 is only there to assess the state of my CD3. It's not giving me all that much information. Um, from there, I'm going to be going into CD19 versus CD49B, um, that's just a generic NK marker, um, CD11C versus um, IA, IE, which is going to look at my MHC um, positive dendritic cells, and then my 4 versus 8 just to kind of class up my, my T cells. From my T cells and my dendritic cells, I'm going to look at two different activation markers and then kind of assess the state of those tertiary markers that I have limited information about. Okay, so this is um, a bit on spreading error that I want to describe to you. First, um, you know, it's extremely important to see what you can see, <laughs> and that very much is involved in data transformation or how to visualize your data. Um, 
when you're looking at the first plot here of APC versus PESI-5, this is just a bead coated with PESI-5, right? There's no other fluorophores on it. It's a single color control. Um, when you're looking at this in um, just logarithmic scaling, you would look at that and think that that population is not accurately compensated because the, the core, the center of those MFI positive and negative are not aligned. But this should also indicate to you all of these events that are close to the axis that I'm not visualizing all the information um, that I've gathered for this marker. So the middle plot here is when I convert it to bi-exponential scaling. Um, that helps me definitely know that I'm not seeing everything. When I start to transform the axis, you, it's also called increasing the width basis. All it's doing is compressing the events so that they're scalable. This is an artifact of a digital instrument that we have events that fall below negative. It doesn't make them not true. It's again, just an error in counting the photon because of the noise of the system. There's nothing wrong with that. It is absolutely true information. So in this instance, we know that this is accurately compensated because as you can see from kind of the heat map of, these, of this dot plot, um, the MFI negative overlaps the MFI positive. So this is gonna be true for any two fluorophore pairs where there is significant overlap. So in this instance, it's per CP Psi 5.5 versus Alexa 700. This is by exponential scaling and then transformed. Um, BV 711 versus Alexa 700. There's not a lot of spillover between these channels but the PMT voltages that are applied to each of these PMTs often have a high disparity. And that's a way in which we create an unrealistic comp value. And spreading error is a direct reflection of a high comp value. So in this instance, that spreading error, again, is not necessarily created by the spillover. And then we have molecules like APC Psi 7 spilling back into APC because the tandem is incomplete. So again, per CP Psi 5.5 does spill directly into Alexa 700 cross beam significantly. You can create spreading error by unbalanced voltages or from incomplete tandems or as the tandems start to break down. So this was also um, visualized really nicely in that paper from Mario. It was in um, cytometry part A. Um, I highly recommend that anyone who's interested in multicolor flow cytometry read this paper. It's very instructive. Um, and here you can see uh, what they're showing you here is that the brighter that the signal gets, and again, these are just beads that have been coated with different amounts of the, of the antibody, the brighter that that signal gets, the more significant the spreading error gets. And that's because the brighter the event is, the greater the distribution of error around the detection of that photon. So that's actually a very, very short synopsis of an extremely complicated concept. So there's lots of papers on spreading error and um, kind of cleaning up the compensation algorithm that we can point you towards if you're interested. So after all of that, this is the panel that I come up with um, on the left-hand side here. So um, the things that I knew were practical considerations from my initial testing of this panel was that I knew CD3 would be downregulated. That's why I put it on BV510. It's a very bright fluorophore, but it's not sacrificing a really sensitive channel for me. Um, it's just good enough for what I need to assess. The, um, I knew that the dynamic range of expression of CD69, ICOS, PD1, and PDL1 were going to be relatively unknown, and I needed to take that into account. Um, I'm not necessarily interested in ICOS expression on NK cells because I've got to put PE Psi 5 someplace, and it's going to screw with my APC channel the most, so I'm going to ensure that those two things are not co-expressed. And then finally, um, my MHC class two on Alexa 700, I needed to make sure that that wasn't gonna be co-expressed with BB711 or a high um, expression of the CD69, um, which it wasn't at all. And Alexa 700 on MHC class two was absolutely beautiful. I was extremely surprised that such a dim fluorophore matched so well to this antigen. All right, so the, the different factors or the, the different data pieces that we're going to go over are going to be the CD3 down regulation, then the localization and activation of the dendritic cells as visualized by changes in localization, um, CD69 and ICOS activation, um, the different activated T cell subsets by the 62L versus 44 phenotype, and then finally correlate all of those changes and those kinetics to the, ser the serum levels for the ELISAs that we did on the back end. 
So first with our CD3 down regulation, when you look at the isotype control, I love CD3 BB510. It's a really fantastic um, combination. I put it with the zombie near infrared, which is my favorite, near, um, my favorite live dead probe right now because I really dislike APC Psi7, so it's a great place to solve a problem. Um, it was absolutely a great combination. Um, as you see from two hours, six hours, and 24 hours, you see a significant decrease in CD3, and that could just be an internalization because of the repeated stimulation and activation of that CD3. Um, but what we needed to assess was that downregulation of CD3 wasn't actually um, and influencing the distribution of our CD4 versus our CD8 populations, um, in which case they absolutely were not. The one that I'm showing you here is at 24 hours, and my CD4 versus my CD8 looks absolutely gorgeous, and that's using the BV570 and the BV711 and that bivariate. Again, two fluorophores that do not have a lot of spillover into one another. Okay, for my splenic DC activation, I think it's kind of important to point out here that as we talk about those parameters that were affected by the VISTA co-injection, you're going to see that the events that would occur early in activation are less affected by the, v the VISTA treatment than those that are occurring later on. So um, when you know, you're looking at you know, dendritic cell localization where there's a nascent or resting dendritic cell population in your spleen that's being activated to migrate to your lymph nodes. So in this instance, I'm using two different FMOs for the MHC class 2 Alexa 700 and then for the CD11C PE Psi 7. In the case of the PE Psi 7, because there is this propensity, especially for dendritic cells, where their job is to scavenge and eat things and, and present things and do things with peptides, I'm going to use an FMO in those instances to ensure that it's not eating and doing something bad with the fluorophore on my antibody. So I'm using any time I'm inserting an FMO, I'm sorry, an isotype control into my FMO, I'm ensuring that the isotype is being used at the same concentration from the same manufacturer as the antibody of interest so that I'm not confounding the application. Um, and in this instance, you can kind of see that there was a tiny bit of nonspecific binding, but well above um, what I'm interested in is well above that tiny amount of nonspecific binding. Um, with my isotype injected, I'm seeing a very large population of resident DCs. That would be what one would expect. And over the course of um, two hours to six hours to 24 hours, I do see a significant depletion of that population that is not affected by VISTA treatment. So once we get to the lymph node, however, um, the, the MHC activation, the MHC um, kind of strength of that signal becomes much more abundant than it was in the spleen. And this could be from activation. Um, without using CD103, we can't really say that it's due to the migration itself, but we can say it's due to the activation. So in this instance, my gait is very different. I'm still using those same two FMOs to, to, to tell me where my positive and negative populations are in my X and Y axis. My isotype injected, there's very few um, kind of resident dendritic cells and the draining lymph nodes. About um, you know, 0.7% was very common. However, the minute that I injected them, that was, um, it took a little bit of time. Two and six hours weren't particularly significant, but by the time we got to 24 hours, not only did we see a very large increase in, in the lymph node localization of the dendritic cells, but we also saw a very big difference between the VISTA treatment and the, um, the non-VISTA treated. And that, so as I was saying before, what you're going to see regularly is just things that were happening later is where VISTA seemed to have a large impact. Um, so also in this case, what was very interesting was this sort of CD11C low pos um, positive population. It's still clearly positive, but I would say it's a lower expressor than, um, than the, uh, the high expressing population here, even though their MHC class 2 is very similar. Okay, so just very simple graph about the kinetics of these things with CD69 and ICOS as we're going on to the activation markers and how they looked over time. Um, it was really very clear. CD69 came up right away. Um, so in the spleen and the lymph nodes, CD69 by six hours was very, very strongly expressed. And there was no um, difference with VISTA treatment statistically in, in those instances. And then at 24 hours, it dropped off very, very, very quickly, um, almost back to resting levels. 
With the ICOS, on the other hand, there was statistical significance in the um, spleen early on and then in the lymph nodes later on with VISTA treatment, and I'll show you that data here. Okay, so with the ICOS, it was a very good lesson in voltage optimization for me especially. I had kept optimizing my assay using just a six-hour stimulation, um, things like titrating my antibodies or, again, uh, assessing the, the, the voltages that I would apply to the assay. Um, so here in this instance, again, I'm using a, 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 a PE-Sci-5 isotype in lieu of absolutely negating the antibody from the FMO because PE-Sci-5 is a very attractive molecule for, um, for dendritic cells and macrophage, for example. So in this case, I actually had a really nice clean gate um, of my ICOS. When I looked at my unactivated cells, there was a little bit of ICOS expression going on. Um, independent of uh, big activation, but it very much changes. And so the, the final third plot on the top here is looking at my six-hour activation state. So I assumed that this voltage was going to be just perfect. Um, however, when I look at my two-hour, my six-hour, and my 24-hour, I was almost in danger of my 24-hour ICOS expression being so strong, so overwhelmingly strong, <laughs> that I was almost off scale. So I was quite lucky that I stayed on scale. Um, but as this was proof of concept, I would go back and adjust these later um, to make sure that I never hit being potentially off scale. Okay, so um, the VISTA um, absolutely had a statistical effect on ICOS and the lymph nodes. So when we're looking at um, the FMO again for these lymph node cells, um, it was quite clean. My isotype control, again, at 24 hours, you see this kind of basal level of ICOS expression. At 24 hours with CD3 injection, it's 74%. It was so strong. Um, but what that means is inadvertently, I am populating a ton of PE Sci 5 background on every single T cell. So that is not necessarily desirable, and I'm going to show you the effect on that later. Um, and then here you can see the ICOS expression on the VISTA treatment um, was. Um, was very significant. I mean, it was a 20% reduction in, um, in ICOS positivity. There was a very clearly a population that was being affected by the VISTA treatment. So how that, how that background coming from the PE Sci-5 hurt me um, was, was kind of a funny realization to come upon. So what you're looking at here in the upper left-hand corner is that really strong VISTA, I'm sorry, that really strong ICOS expression. Um, where at 24 hours that went from being basically no populating PE Sci-5 to a ton of it. What that looked like in the lower left hand side the, here on the isotype, if I gated on the MFI negative, so my negative population for each of these plots, what you would see is that on my NK cells, so here what you're looking at is my CD19 on BV650, so my B cells, and then my AP, um, my CD49 APC, which is just my NK cells. I do not expect expression of ICOS on my NK cells. However, what I was seeing over time was this very large change in the totally negative cells where my T cells are and how much background was being populated in that space. So by the time I got to 24 hours, there was so much error occurring in here because of the extremely high um, ICOS expressing that those T cells in here were, were populating. So that can definitely be problematic. My best solution for that here, a very quick solution, would have been just to dump all my T cells. Don't even have them on the plot when I'm analyzing, since they have really no effect whatsoever on my ability to gate the other two. Um, but that's what these line graphs here are showing you, these histograms, is that on the NK cells, the actual positive gate, you're seeing no ICOS expression at all. And however, if I gate it on the MFI negative, I see here this blue bivariate kind of <laughs> histogram um, or bimodal histogram. I see very different changing levels of that PE Sci 5 background. So that's definitely a warning sign, right? You, you can solve some of that with analysis, but this is one of the reasons we think so heavily about how to match the fluorophores. So to move on to the different T cell subsets using CD44 and CD62L on Alexa 488 and on BV785, both of these fluorophores are considered to be relatively dim. Um, however, when the cells become activated, your CD44 does increase in expression quite a lot. That's your activated cell population. Um, however, the transition isn't always fluid. If I were to do this again, I would actually put both of these on slightly stronger markers um, or slightly brighter fluorophores 
um, in the hopes of being able to resolve them even better. But as it was, it wasn't so bad. And I did use my FMOs to find where my gating parameters were. However, FMOs do not help you out when you need to find a low positive population. There is no control that will help you find the perfect gate for low versus high expression. So that is for spleen. This is for lymph node. They had very similar kinetics, except for lymph node was a little bit more delayed. Again, it was just a, a time factor. So when I look at these, um, maybe a little bit more artistically, but looking at those sorts of plots isn't as helpful when I'm trying to draw um, correlations between, say, the cytokine expression that I'm getting out of my um, ELISAs. So what we're looking at here is kind of zero hours being the basal or isotype control injected levels of that cytokine. We looked at interferon gamma, IL-4, TNF-alpha, and IL-6 at two hours, again, six hours, 24 hours from the tail vein cut. Uh, we were looking at serum. We coagulated the blood, took it out, and, and left a serum sample. Um, and then we're kind of looking at generically the, the progress of each of the activation markers. And we saw exactly what we expected, which was a relatively quick increase of IL-4, TNF-alpha, and IL-6, um, but a much later response of the interferon gamma since those are known to have a kind of inverse relationship. Um, and those did correlate with CD69 and interferon gamma and, um, and my memory subsets here. So same with lymph node, again, but it was just slightly delayed and sometimes the, um, the amounts were not quite as dramatic as in, this, as in the spleen. So one of the biggest um, issues a lot of people complain about with multicolor flow or anything that's above 10 colors is compensation. So what I wanted to show you was what my comp matrix looked like for this assay. Um, what my strategy is, is to sit down at the cytometer, neutralize all my voltages to about 500, and start working on optimizing the range of expression of that antigen um, from a neutral point voltage-wise. Because the quickest way for you to create too high of a comp value is to have too large of a disparity of voltages. And that's when you hear people say, I have 200% compensation. And that's when you'll hear us say, it's because your voltages of your PMTs are entirely out of balance. <laughs> Fluorophores cannot spill over 200% into a neighbor's channel. So you're creating that differential. So here, what you're looking at are the CST recommended voltages for our PMTs on our Fortessa, some of them being extremely ridiculous, being much too high. Do not just use your CST voltages, or most of your markers will be off scale. Um, in this instance, for example, with my PE Psi 5, you remember how strong that ICOS expression was? I was using a voltage of 540. If I had been using the CST recommended voltage, I would have been extremely off scale, probably even at six hours. So just a, <laughs> a warning, um, your CST voltages are not the default voltages. Um, the voltages between channels that have heavy spillover should remain as neutral to one another as possible so that you're not inadvertently over amplifying contributing photons. It is a photo multiplier tube after all. And organize the panel so that those imbalances don't lead to artificially high comp values that could cause you trouble with spreading error. So here's um, a little bit of a kind of graphical view of our, um, our comp matrix. So you're going to have particular fluorophores, like all seven brilliant violet fluorophores, where they're going to have a certain amount of spillover into each, um, into each neighbor's channel from the red direction. You can see that the voltages are not particularly widely spread. Your, um, um, your BV421 channel will always have a very low voltage. It's also because it's an extremely bright fluorophore. Um, however, the disparity here is not tremendous. Um, so some of these can be relatively high, um, BV650 into BV0711, for example, um, BV510 into BV570. Um, whether or not that value causes you any trouble, high comp values do not mean reduced sensitivity. What they can mean is if the marker is highly expressed and the fluorophore is very bright on the thing that's spilling into its neighbor, and the neighbor is very lowly abundant and very dim, then that high comp value could mean reduced sensitivity. But it doesn't always, it's not a default. You're also going to have instances of cross beam compensation, for example, BV570 into PE and PE into BV570. All proteins like APC 
will have some excitation off of the violet laser and they will emit somewhat into the different brilliant violet channels. Most people are worried about the reverse, but it happens both ways. So the brilliant violet 650 into APC is only 14%. This is not cross beam that you have to worry about. And then you're always going to have these channels that have um, potentially diminishing sensitivity, the largest of which is Alexa 700. It's such a dim fluorophore that even on CD45, sometimes it's hard to maintain any sort of resolvability of that marker. And that's just because APC Psi 7 is spilling into it, APC is spilling into it, PE Psi 5.5 is spilling into it, PE Psi 5 is spilling into it. All of those are contributing a lot of background into that channel, and it is not bright enough to overcome that assault. Okay, so the next steps for me for this assay, it was largely a proof of concept. Um, you know, again, we don't have a ton of animals to dedicate to this. I was lucky to get the 35 that I got to optimize this. Um, but I would like to see more discrete time points. Um, you know, you, we knew that the cytokine storm was happening right away, um, so it's likely that we're going to see even higher cytokine levels at shorter than two hours. Um, I would drop PE Psi 5 from the channel. Um, from the panel, but I would also be able to do that because I found that fast ligand was not changing whatsoever across the entire application. So I could easily take the PE that fast ligand was on and drop PE Psi 5 from my panel and rearrange it slightly. Um, so I would have also liked to have CD103 so that I could show that those dendritic cells that were going or that were increasing in abundance in my lymph node were actually migrating. Um, that was an important one that I missed. And I would very much prefer to have a multiplex ELISA assay than just single ELISA's one-off that was extremely time consuming. Um, and then finally, if we were really interested in this, I mean, PD, anti-PD-1 is also a potential therapeutic that's being explored right now. I would love to know just generally different delivery schedules, different amounts, um, you know, the 100 micrograms that we use, maybe it just wasn't Maybe it need to be primed with that or followed with it or, you know, these are the things that we're encountering right now in immunotherapy research. Anyways, that's half the battle is to know how to, um, you know, how to prime that, that response and make sure that it's as efficacious as possible. So this involved a lot of my colleagues, Miguel, Jeanette, Naomi, um, our bosses, John and Zung, who all were in um, large support of this application development. So thank you very much for your time.